All right, welcome everybody. My name is Christopher from Open Mind Integration. Super excited to have Lisa uh, back here, also now known as Majaya Jade Lee. And um, yeah, we're gonna have a cool talk tonight. Uh, Lisa is going to, uh, also Majaya, uh, is, is going to be sharing about healing compulsivity with psychedelic therapy and play. Uh, she's got a, a really interesting background in somatic psychology, neurobiology, uh, addiction trauma, um, specializes in embodiment of agency and change. Um, Lisa's education uh, includes masters in somatic psychology training at the psychedelic somatic um, uh, oh, in interactional psychotherapy and um, psychobiological approach to couples therapy and well there's a few there spanning trauma um, somatic and uh, meditation sound uh, business computer science so I I appreciate having her here for um, the insights because we are able to get a nice range in perspective, uh, something that you may not hear uh, in most places. So, um, yeah, I, I'll turn it over to Lisa here in a second. Uh, first, just want to um, say if you're interested in more events like this, uh, I have a newsletter at openmindintegration.com and we'll, we'll I'm sure we'll have Lisa back at some point. Uh, uh, we had Lisa's colleague, um, Jane Latimer, uh, last month and generally just like to cover topics of psychedelics and healing and growth and spirituality. Um, you know, these are just areas of, of discovery that I'm very passionate about and uh, much of my practice is focused on as well. So if you have any questions, inquiries, or would like to just uh, get in touch and more involved in this space, uh, feel free to reach out and um, I'll, be, I'll, I'll post again uh, Lisa's contact and her websites, um, again, also known as Vijaya or Majaya. So um, please take it away, Lisa. And um, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Christopher. Um, yeah, so just in regards to the name, I've gone through a legal name change in the last month, um, but I don't take offense if you still call me Lisa. It's a long story as to how Majaya Jade Lee come, came into being, and it's actually pretty directly related to um, this topic. But uh, if you're interested at the end, I'll share a little bit about it. Um, Otherwise, what I'd like to talk about today is really going into the brain science, the neurobiology around compuls compulsivity, especially around compulsive eating, um, and as well as sex addiction, sexual anorexia, uh, gaming, that sort of thing. Um, and for those who don't know me personally or professionally, uh, I have quite an extensive personal background in the area of compulsive eating and various forms of compulsive behavior. So I know this deeply at a personal level. If you want more, if you want to learn more about that, I have a other video that Chris and I did, another talk that Chris and I did about a month and a half ago that's posted on my YouTube channel. You can go there to find out a lot more about my history around it. Uh, I'm not going to go into my history in this uh this talk, I'd like to just stick with really addressing some of the, the brain science and neuroscience behind it, what I've discovered and what, have I, what I've applied to really heal and recover from what I think was pretty much a, let's call it a disorder or a compulsion that um, almost put me in the grave more than once and made my life uh, a living hell over and over and over and over and over again for probably uh, four decades. Um, so if you're there, I can relate, and uh, it is not a fun place to be. Um, and uh, so I hope that what I can offer might um, serve you in some way to help you along your your journey or your recovery recovery path. All right. So let me throw up some slides. I'd like to do about thirty to forty five minutes of just talking about the concepts that I applied for my, for, for my own recovery, um, drawing on neurobiology, drawing on psychedelic therapy, drawing on, on uh, child psychology, drawing on the neurobiology of play, 
And so I'm going to go thick into that. And then for the last 45 minutes, I'd like to just do question and answer. Okay. So if you've got questions that come up during this um, talk, just write them down and save them to the end. Uh, and then I'll just, we'll just dive into whatever you've got for questions. All right. Okay. Anything I'm missing, Chris, before, Christopher, before I jump in that you think that's... I think that's cool. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Okay. Um, Chris, if there's something that I share and it's like a little bit uh, not making sense to you, if you could be like the voice of the group and just maybe let me know and I can always clarify if there's something that comes up. Okay. Sure, sure. We'll um, throw it. Okay. All right. So here's our agenda. So what we're going to consider is compulsion as deprivation right? or compulsion as starvation, right? And so it's, the question is, what are we deprived of? And then after we go into that, we're going to look at how does the system or how does the body get into the state of deprivation? Like what's, what's going on at a cultural level, interpersonal level, at an internal level that's causing this, this uh, internal neurobiological state of deprivation or starvation? And then we're going to look at ways in which we can actually restore order, optimize the system, um, move the system out of a state of starvation and deprivation into a state of aliveness, into a state of sustenance. And it's through that process that in, in my experience that compulsions, because it's much related to a sense of deprivation, they, they begin to resolve themselves. They're just ultimately a symptom of a chronic state Compulsions are a symptom of a chronic state of deprivation or starvation at the neurobiological level. And it's not starvation or deprivation of food. There are other aspects of our neurobiology that it, it, that it is starved of. Um, so that's what we're gonna jump into. Before we get started, I just wanna make reference to the scholars that I'm bringing into this work in case I forget to mention them later on. So you've got Dr. Dan Siegel, he's been instrumental in my theories and my studies. Um, we've got Dr. Stephen Porge with Neural Behavioralism. Uh, we'll be talking, this whole topic is on the study of, of our neurobiology and the polyvagal theory, and I'll be touching in on that as we go. Saj Ravi, he is the founder of the Psychedelic Somatic Interactional Psychotherapy model. That's the model that I'm trained under. We're gonna be applying his model along with some of the concepts related to his model um, to the recovery of compulsive behavior. And then you've got some archetypal and spiritual, spiritual, spiritual psychology uh, scholars such as James Hillman, Thomas Moore, in the archetypal realm and imaginal psychology realm. And then finally, my favorite, which is Donald Winnikoff. Donald Winnikoff was um, basically, he was like the main guy in my doctorate dissertation um, that I studied. I studied Winnikoff theory and how Winnikoff theory could be applied uh, to resolve compulsions and addictions. And this is a guy that died when he was like in the 1970s. And so his theories are really big in the 1950s. And he was a pediatrician, a psychoanalyst, studied children, and the instinct for play and how play with the appropriate holding environment, the appropriate safety could support the resolving of what he deemed as wicked behavior. And remember this is like back in the 1930s, 40s and 50s. So the terminology is a little different back then. All right, so let's get started. So let's consider first the, the whole, the possibility that compulsions are a sense of deprivation. And where that comes from is I, I got that term deprivation from two scholars. One was Pat Carnes. Pat Carnes, he's he's written many books on sex addiction. And he's written many, or he's written a book on what's called sexual anorexia. So sexual anorexia is the opposite of sex addiction. So ultimately, right, sexual anorexia is about being starved of healthy sexuality. We are sexual beings. And what can happen is due to shame, due to trauma, due to a lot of cultural, uh, religious, um, interpersonal impingements and um, uh, thwarting, we can move into a, a sort of hypo arousal or a diminishing or thwarting of our sexual uh, sense of being or healthy sexuality. And so he 
he terms, he has a term in his, one of his books called sexual anorexia. He's got a term saying sex as deprivation. And I loved that term because it's also in Donald Winnicott's work, what he refers to as the system becomes deprived of the living experience, right? And as a result, compulsions emerge, right? So if you have a sense of essential self, the authentic self, when it becomes impinged or thwarted, right? Then your sense of aliveness, your sense of like, your sense of living, your sense of capacity to live life, your living experience becomes, you're deprived of it. And then the system begins to shut down and then it moves into a state of compulsion. It starts to act out. So this is what we're gonna take a look at is compulsive behavior, whether it's sex, eating, gaming, cutting, is, is, is a result of the, our neurobiology, our body is out of balance and it's moving into a state of deprivation. Right? And then there's an acting out process that's happening. Okay, So the system is starved. So when I say system, I sometimes interchange the word system for body, body for system, but ultimately just think of our bodies as starved. It's starved of something, right? So we need to think bigger than starved of food. The, our neurobiology, our body ha is a living organism. All living organisms have needs. And if one of these, one or more of these needs or aspects of the neurobiology is thwarted, then what shows up is the system becomes starved it becomes deprived of that need and so ultimately what we're trying to do is restore order to various aspects of our nervous system various aspects of our the living our living organisms needs okay so if you think about it what are like two or three uh, needs that the neurobiology has well one obvious one is going to be something like uh, the the need or the instinct to reach and connect and co-regulate attachment secure attachment is a strong strong need for our neurobiology for our bodies okay? and co-regulation another one is a strong healthy um, modulated capacity for fight right the instinct to fight to mobilize to do to go to act or the other one is to walk away, to move away, to flee. We need to have access to that and not in this rogue, untamed, unmanageable place, but being able to mobilize into states of, of either an agency, a push and fight or a move away in a very healthy, regulated, modulated way. And often those, those don't get developed uh, in our culture. Often we get shamed for having a sense of fight, having a sense of agency. So these, these types of needs that the neurobiology has can begin to actually get diminished and weakened because they're just simply underdeveloped or they've been shamed out of us or they've been due to trauma, they've been kind of thwarted out of us, impinged, okay? Then the system goes out of balance and we get the sense of starvation. So I love Peter Levine's statement, the second statement that you see here, it says, unable to feel our instinctual aliveness, we are left with certain cravings. These impulses or cravings generally revolve around two primary instincts, self-survival or species survival, sex. Right. So think about it. If the system is out of balance and is feeling starved and is actually because the system is out of balance, it can't move into a state of thriving. If it's feeling deprived of a particular aspect of self, whether it's attachment, whether it's um, the, the capacity to mobilize or flee, there's other ones as well that we'll talk about, then what happens is the system can't regulate. It's almost like it moves into a state of um, survival terror. It can't thrive. It doesn't have a sense of sustenance. It can't optimize. And then it moves into a sense of anxiety or survival terror. And then from that, the system is going to orient to a place of self-survival, right? Dog eat dog, you against me. And the collective survival kind of begins to shut down. It's no longer about you and me. It's no longer about a togetherness. It's more of a sense of, I need to have control over you, or I need to shrink and hide to protect myself. All of the sort of survival instincts become almost overdeveloped, over differentiated, and they begin to hijack um, our capacity to 
become alive and create and self-author our lives, right? Okay, so that's the premise behind what I discovered um, around how I basically began to understand my own compulsivity and where it was coming from. So at the end of the day, you can consider that compulsions are a deprivation of the essential self or a sense of instinctual aliveness, okay? or as Winnikoff describes, a living experience. So there's some aspect of life, of life itself, that the neurobiology is being deprived of. Okay? So I'm just going to say that again. There's some aspect of life, of breath, of vitality, that the human system is being deprived of. And I, again, I like the statement from Peter Levine on the topic. Our ancient design remains intact. Thus, it is our legacy to feel really alive only when our survival instincts are fully engaged. We must unveil our instincts as, as they live within us rather than being alienated from them or forcibly driven by them. So what he's referring to is that embodied sense of liveness, that sense of sustenance and vitality, the embodied sense of life, right? It can only come in on, into being, our sense of aliveness, our sense of being, our sense of existence, our sense of self can only come into being when we have access and are able to fully engage our in instincts. So he's referring to these survival instincts, right? So what does he mean by survival instincts? Right? And then how do we actually um, bring these survival instincts into being and have them be something that we can use to support our uh, recovery path or self-authorship path, as opposed to be forced, you know, being dragged around, um, having them feel out of control. All right. So, here is a few examples of these survival instincts. Well, let me back up. So let's just kind of review this from a, a bit of a different perspective. So one or more aspects of our neurobiology can be thwarted. When you've got one or more um, components or needs or aspects of our neurobiology of our system that's thwarted or underdeveloped, or even overdeveloped, what happens is your neurobiological system, your body, your organism, the living body that you are inhabiting cannot actualize, it can't optimize, it can't come to life. It's thwarted, aspects of it are thwarted. It's no different than you driving a Lamborghini and you haven't put, you know, maybe an aspect of the lamp, you've got a like flat tire and you expect it to actually run properly. We've really got to find out what are the aspects of the system that are thwarting, that are underdeveloped, haven't been polished, haven't been cleaned, or have, might be kicked in the shins and being dented, and they need to actually be um, nurtured back to life in order for the whole system to come to life. Right? That's what we're looking at. So how can we optimize the system so, so you can come back into a state of sustenance and aliveness and vitality? When that system isn't in a place of aliveness, when there is subsystems that aren't optimized, then the system itself, the body itself feels completely deprived. It, it creates a feeling of anxiety, annihilation, tear, like it can't breathe. It can't come to life. How can anything come to life when it's not optimized? Okay. So examples of subsystems or aspects of the body that may be underdeveloped or overdeveloped or thwarted as a result of trauma, exact, et cetera, et cetera. One, I'm gonna actually not go the list top to bottom. I'm just gonna pick ones. So one example is your nervous system, what's called vertical integration if you use Dan Siegel's work. So this would be, you have an underdeveloped fight instinct or an overdeveloped fight instinct, that any time something happens in life, that fight instinct basically hijacks you and you're off to the races arguing or mo moving into a state of rage. Or maybe you have an underdeveloped or overdeveloped 
flight instinct that that anytime there's a fear or a threat or a stress, you bolt. Okay. Or perhaps you are someone who has an over, overdeveloped freeze instinct. So deer in a headlights. Anytime there's any sense of stress in your environment, the system just goes abort the mission and it goes straight into freeze and perhaps dissociation. Okay. So you've got an overdeveloped sense of freeze response. And often, if that's the case, then you've got an underdeveloped flight response and an underdeveloped, and an underdeveloped um, fight response. So when we've got that, whatever you've got going on, whether it's an overdeveloped or underdeveloped fight, flee, flee or freeze, you've got your, you've got the system can't optimize, right? It's going to end up using the wrong tool for the wrong situation. When you need to use a fight response, you're using a dorsal vagal freeze response. And you'll just keep using it when it's like, I've got a hammer, so everything looks like a nail. I'm just going to freeze at every situation. You, then the system can't optimize. And in those, then what shows up is the system is going to have to find other ways to create safety. Because it's like, we can't keep using freeze all the time. So then it's going to move into compulsions. It'll move into compulsive eating, to isolate, to hide, to shut down. It also reinforces the freeze response. We know that compulsive eating creates a numbing, an opiate effect, kind of creates this kind of collapse, it softens. So that's just one example. You can have an overdeveloped, unhealthy sexuality or a very underdeveloped sexuality where you're in the sexual anorexia, which then that would need to be developed. Or you might have an autonomic nervous system that's completely dysregulated. Okay. You can have interpersonal uh, challenges, which is an aspect of your nervous system. You can have what's called memory and narrative integration problems, meaning your past, your history doesn't make any sense. And you have a storyline that maybe someone told you or a storyline that just seems incomplete that actually doesn't feel integrated to your nervous system. The trauma is unresolved from your history and it's showing up in a way in which the narrative doesn't make sense. And as a result, our nervous system wants to use the past to help it navigate the future. Okay? It's trying to use the experience of the past and integrate that in a proper way so then it can actually self-author a different future. It can make a different choice for the future. But if it doesn't make, if it can't make sense of the past, it can't actually self-author a new moment in time for the future. Instead, it's going to reenact the old patterns in an attempt to bring them up so it can actually make sense of it in order to actually then finally move on to self-author a new possibility. And that's really, really important to understand that we can have thwarting or um, dysregulation or disintegration in the memories and the narratives of our past. And our nervous system does not like that. It wants to really have a, have a sense, a felt sense of the history so we can then begin to actually leverage it and harness it and use it as kind of fer fertile ground to help us create something new for the future. And so then that brings us to the last one, which is creative, creative living. This is a word or a term coined by Donald Winnikoff. And he suggests that creativity is an instinct. It's a survival instinct. It's the, our capacity to evolve, to transform, to self-author, and it can get thwarted. Right? So you've got a number of components of our, ner of our nervous system, of our autonomic, of our neurobiology, that easily can get thwarted or underdeveloped, undernourished, and then our whole sense of aliveness can begin to get thwarted. If a subsystem isn't optimized or developed or fostered, then you've, you're, you're lopsided and you can't bring this whole system, the, the neurobiology, our bodies to life. Okay. All right. So I'm going to go into each of these just a, a tiny bit more. So the first one that I mentioned here as a subsystem that can be either over or underdeveloped, which causes a sense of deprivation to the system is consciousness. So we have a part of our brain at right, the prefrontal cortex 
that loves to be more the observer self. So we've got the observer self and we've got the experiencing self. And those two pieces of our essential self have to be in balance. And if they're not, it creates dysregulation. And with dysregulation, we can then attempt to manage it with certain compulsive behaviors. So one area of our neurobiology that we want to make sure is in balance is the, is the ability to observe the self, right? Be mindful of the self and the experience of self. So one example where this can go wrong is um, with individuals that do transcendental meditation, which is an awesome meditation, but it can be overdeveloped to the point where you are overriding your body and overriding your body's experience. And you're just in this observer mind, so unattached, you're not in your living experience. You're not in your living organism body. You're not having a human experience. And as a result, the compulsion can be to keep returning back to transcendental meditation in an attempt to self-soothe. Okay? Any expanding your window of tolerance towards having a living experience in this living human body can be almost intolerable and can frighten the, frighten the system because it doesn't know how to handle that. And so then it just overdevelops and overdifferentiates towards the, the state of consciousness or mindfulness. Right? And then of course, your neurobiology isn't gonna like that. So it's gonna try and move you back into expanding your window of what you can tolerate for a, the living experience, having a human experience on this planet. And because that window of tolerance isn't very large, then what shows up is that the system begins to fragment and then the compulsion becomes, I have to return to my transcendental meditation, okay? That's one example, okay? You can have the opposite. I, Chris, did you? Uh, I was just gonna say, I, I actually went to the Transcendental Meditation University and I saw this on a level that most people wouldn't believe. There was people meditating for decades and they just opted out of life. They just stopped doing everything. So that was spot on. Thank you. That was awesome. You're welcome. Yeah, you see it all the time. You see it in the in the psychedelic assisted psychotherapy world. Where and and maybe we'll take a look at let's actually go into this direction just for a second. So so you can use psychedelics to really help you heal, and they can be so powerful and consistent in so many ways. But sometimes we can unintentionally use the medicines in the same way that we are using transcendental meditation, where we are lifting off out of the body, out of the lived experience, and we're going somewhere else in this dissociated state. So it becomes a, a sense of escapism, and it can become a compulsive. Okay. All right, so let's move on to the next one. Oh, actually, I forgot to mention, some people are overdeveloped in the other realm. So you can be overdeveloped in the realm of mindfulness, where you're very detached from the living experience, or you can be overdeveloped in the living experience and have very little window of tolerance for being the observer, right? So you're very much swept up by suffering. You really struggle and stay in the sense of the material world, in the body, in the pain. And it's it's almost feels like you're in, like it feels like you're in jail. At least that's how it's felt like for me. Is I'm stuck and I'm trapped and I can't get out of this lived experience, and it's just all pervasive. Right. So in that case, building that sense of um, the consciousness or the mindfulness would be a really good thing. Okay. However, some people cannot do that, and I'll explain way later, Chris. If I don't explain it, remind me. I, we're going to come back to a term called uh, neuroception. Um, Stephen Porgy talks about people who struggle to move into states of transcendental meditation or mindfulness. It often is because they need a prerequisite. And that is what's referred to as neuroception. Okay, so we're going to talk about that. Okay, another subsystem that can, can be completely um, thwarted or compromised is our attachment system, right? We have, because we are live in this living experience in these living bodies, we, we are drawn to one another. We, we are social beings. We're driven towards, a, towards attachment. 
And that subsystem can be compromised. And when it's compromised, we can then again, move into various compulsions. So if we look at this poor monkey here, um, this is the famous story of a monkey was brought into, given two cages, one dispensed food, but had no fur around it, dispensed food and water. The other monkey had fur, right? And felt like a, a mama monkey. So the question is, did the monkey go to the cage, the surrogate mom that dispensed food and water, or did it go to the cage where it dispensed fur <laughs> or it had fur? It went to the surrogate money, monkey that had fur over and over and over again. That this monkey had a stronger drive towards attachment and connection and that tactile sense of touch than it did food, okay? This is really, really important because often there's two pieces here. Now food will stimulate similar circuits to attachment and connection. It's like, you know, if you look at the um, element table and you've got cadmium and calcium and your body might crave calcium but it can't get calcium for whatever reason. And cadmium is kind of a close element to it. It'll start just taking in cadmium instead. It's sort of the same thing. It's like, it's like food will is an attempt at stimulating some of those social circuits or so, uh, co-regulatory circuits, um, but it's not the same thing. And so what can happen is that the system is deeply deprived of social engagement and connection, it will eventually try to move to food as an attempt to get what it can't get with attachment. But if you really go deep into the neurobiology, it's truly looking for attachment, right? Attachment is meant to calm, in some cases, the nervous system, right? Co-regulation, collaboratively regulating with another human being is meant to soften us. It's meant for us to feel safe in and trusting in and amongst another individual. When that doesn't happen, the nervous system goes into a state of vigilance. Well, our nervous systems can't stay in vigilance. It's not healthy. It'll kill us to always stay in vigilance. So we'll, tr so the system will try to find something else. It'll feel deprived. It's like, I can't stay in the state of vigilance all the time. I need something to soothe myself, to bring myself back down to homeostasis. Mom's not around. Dad's not around. Maybe dad's a threat. Mom's a threat. Something's happening that's, that, that the system can't co-regulate. So it'll look for something else. It'll try to find a trick. Food is an example of a trick. Alcohol is an example of a trick. Masturbation is another example of a trick. Cutting can be another trick. The system uses to try in an attempt to bring the vigilance down. It often doesn't work. Instead, it brings it into a state of freeze as opposed to dropping it into a healthier state of homeostasis. Did I do that? Do you guys see the yellow line? Is it only me that sees it? I, I see yeah, it, I yeah. See it. I see it. <laughs> I must have hit something. All right, we'll see if it comes up here. Oh, I wonder how I get rid of that. All right, you guys get a, a line on the slide. Oh, right, yeah, I don't. Oh, it might be the, on Zoom. You can like draw. Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, they annotate. Yeah, there should Let's be an see, undo. Erase. There's an undo button on there. the top there. I got it. <laughs> Okay, so here's what happens at the nervous system level. When you've got um, a monkey, let's say this guy here, who has got a good, healthy mama, is the, the, the child, I think that's someone else that's doing that. I don't think that's me. Unless there's... I'll see if I can disable something to prevent that. I mean, it's cute, but it's... <laughs> I think it's a new feature or something. 
I mean, I'm okay with it if everyone else is. I don't know if it's distracting. It's, I think it's fine. It's fine? Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah, we'll leave it unless it starts scribbling all over the. So you've got, um, if you look at the reptile, reptilian part of the brain or the brain stem, you've got your green. What that refers to is safety. So the bottom piece is safety. This is your sense of, I feel safe and connected and aware of my surroundings, open and relaxed. Right. Then you've got your red zone, your do, your go, your act. If you get really high up into the red, it's your fight and your flee. If, if you feel very overwhelmed because you're in a state of real threat and you're feeling like you can't escape or mobilize out of the threat, you then move into a freeze, right? So with this little guy, right? If he was just given a monkey that dispensed food and water, but didn't provide any connection, what would happen is that little monkey would be moving out of that sense of safety and would start to probably feel pretty anxious and tense, maybe panicky, and keep trying and trying and trying. And then eventually, the pain of not being able to get that real connection would be so great and he would feel like he wouldn't be able to mobilize out of the situation that he's just trapped. The only option he has is to attempt to connect with a caregiver that's only offering food and water and it's not what he or she wants. So then the system moves into a freeze response and numbs itself, it thwarts that need for connection because the pain is too great. So then in the freezing, you could say that subsystem to the overall body or organism is now thwarted. It's now gone dead. It's no longer alive. That instinct is now kind of um, underdeveloped. Okay. And perhaps the instinct for seeking food, shelter would be overdeveloped. So that's kind of how that goes, all right? Okay, let's look at the next one. So creative living, so creativity is an instinct and Carl Jung is the first um, uh, scholar that kind of coined that term of creativity as instinct. And if we use Donald Winnicott's words, it's creative living is a universal need and a universal experience. Okay. So again, he's even referring to it as like, it's a need, it's an essential aspect of self, of our neurobiology. So he says, unhappy is you or me who lacks what is essential to, to a human being. It's much more important than eating or even physical survival. In creative living, you or I find that everything What's the next word? That everything, I can't see the next word. Everything we do strengthens the feeling that we are alive. Okay, let's unpack this. So he's suggesting that creative living, so the, the capacity to evolve is a universal need. Okay? And it is essential to being a human being. It is more important than food or physical survival. So it's literally the capacity to evolve is so important that our neurobiology or the, or the mother nature that fuels our organism is it's, it's more important to her than even the physical survival, right? even food, which makes sense. It's all about survival of the species in some ways, the evolution of the species. Right? So we have this innate capacity inside of ourselves to create, to evolve. That's an absolute essential instinctual need. Right? And often in our culture, it gets thwarted. It is underdeveloped. We don't, we don't have classes in, 
in grade school or high school and how to access this instinct and bring it to life and know how to harness it and leverage it. And yet what happens is when it's not leveraged, we don't have any agency in our lives. We have no capacity to create our lives. We're at the mercy of life kind of bullying us. And then what shows up is we can then move into compulsions as, a, as an attempt to create safety, to hide from a world we don't feel safe in, that we have no agency around, or we might move into compulsions such as sex addiction, grooming, sexual grooming behavior, and attempt to have power over the world, have power over another. We can do that even um, with something like uh, um, gaming, where we might not like video gaming, we may not have any sense of agency or feel like we have any capacity to create our actual real lives in this real world, but we have this amazing sense of power in this virtual world. We can create anything in this virtual world and it become, can become addictive. If we don't know how to harness that creative capacity within our real world. And so the virtual world becomes this, this place of like, infinite possibility that is not grounded in our bodies in relationship and it can become addictive it can be a very powerful draw especially when we feel no sense of aliveness no sense of creative capacity no sense of agency in this real world and again it's no different than transcendental meditation right we attempt to move into this real world we attempt to engage in this real world we don't have the window of tolerance for it so then we move back into the gaming world, into the virtual world. My background is computer science. I saw this more times than I care to think about, right? If you are a coder, the, the world of coding and software development, it's like you've got like, like a cauldron, a magic cauldron in front of you. and You can whip up anything you want. That's what it's like to be a coder. And it's so easy to do that, right? In this virtual world, you can create anything. And then you try to then compare that to living a human experience on this human planet. Who would want to do that? Especially when you've got like everything at your fingertips and you have agency and power in this virtual world. It'd be so hard to then move into this real world. Especially if you don't have, if you don't have the skills for creative living and you haven't harnessed that instinct, the, you're naturally going to want to just move into an easier world, which is the virtual world. Okay. All right. Okay. So last slide for this section, and then I'll open it up for questions, is just a review. So compulsion can be a result of our bodies, our, our living organism feeling starved of one or more aspects of our instinctual aliveness. Okay. So whether what's being starved is our capacity to create our worlds, have agency in our world, or whether what's being starved is our capacity to reach for another and co-regulate, or maybe what's being starved of us is an ability to modulate our um, fight flight mechanisms and be able to actually move in and out of that in a way in which we feel safe and connected with others. And then we can mobilize into a doing and acting response. These are examples of things that can get thwarted in our neurobiology. And then the result is that the system not feeling deprived. It is deprived. That's exactly what's happening. And then compulsions show up as an attempt to manage or mediate that. And what I find frustrating, um, especially when it comes to things like sex addiction and food addiction, is we tackle it as if it is a behavioral issue or a moral issue, right? Well, if you just stop that, just stop it. Or you just need to follow this food plan. Why are you still eating? Just follow the food plan. And when it's not working, and then we, then we have maybe like family and ourselves then shaming us. Like, why can't we do it? Why can't we do it? We should be able to do it. We're not recognizing the complexity that there could be something so much deeper, that there's deadness in the system. The system isn't alive and it's feeling suffocated because it can't breathe. These needs, these instincts don't have any breath. Right. Um, in the realm of food, I have, I've experienced like one of like four or five types of individuals. 
There's people who maybe overeat a little bit and then they decide, you know, I got to clean up my act. So they go on a food plan or some way of eating and they clean up their act and they're good. And then you've got the, the other component, the other kind of the, what segment of individuals, which is they've got some uh, addictive, like they might be addicted to sugar. So they might um, follow a food plan, cut out sugar, flour and wheat, and they're good. All right. They discovered what works for them. Okay, great. Then you got the next group of people, which is, okay, well, they've got a problem maybe with food. So they find a food plan. They then uh, address their sugar addiction. And maybe they go to therapy and they learn boundaries and they're good. <laughs> they go. And then the fourth category of people is like, okay, none of that worked for them. But then they follow the food plan. They cut out the sugar they go to therapy and they follow maybe a 12 step program for like overeaters anonymous and then they're good <laughs> and then there's the rest of us where it is a much deeper issue it's an it's an issue of soul it's an issue of existence it's an issue of embodied sense of aliveness where we need to come into a sense of being where there's so many facets that need to be looked at um, from a relational point of view from a somatic point of view from a creative authorship point of view, that is that really what we're doing is restoring order. And I do think the 12 step model touches in on that, but oftentimes even the 12 step overeaters and honest model can be used as even another form of avoidance of some of the things that might be going on deeper. Um, but that's another topic. Okay, so I wanna share this, um, this comment by uh, Winnikoff. Compulsive wickedness is about the last thing to be cured or eventually stopped by moral education. The child knows in his bones that it is hope that is locked up in the wicked behavior. And that it is despair that is linked to the compliance and false socialization. For the antisocial or wicked person, the moral educator is on the wrong side. That might be a mouthful, but what I want you to hone into is that the first two sentences. So compulsive wickedness, so to speak. So compulsive uh, uh, behaviors are the last thing to be cured by moral education. You can reason it. You can have as many whys as you want. It's not enough. Right? The child knows in his bones that it is hope that's locked up in the wicked behavior. It's, if you look at behavior, just compulsion is like Morse code. It, it's in the compulsion that there is something, it's, it's trying to speak to us. It's, uh, Thomas More describes it as, it's the soul speaking to us through symptomology. And if we can begin to learn our own Morse code, our own SOS code that's showing up in the compulsiveness, then we'll begin to see what are the underlying impingements to the system? What subsystems are being impinged that need to come to life? Okay. All right, so I'm gonna pause there. I have um, others, we still have to talk about the, the PSI, P model and some other models, but that was a lot already. I think you explained everything really great, though. Um, definitely got a lot of really good key points, and I'm sure there's some good questions. I have a few things to get some conversations going, if you'd like, though, too. I'm happy either way. Um, if any folks have yeah. questions, feel free to use the... Well, are you ready for questions now, though? Yeah, let's do questions. Hey, yeah, if you, uh, you can use the hand raise function thing. Uh, or emoji or this yeah that one um or just jump in the chat and i'll, I'll kind of grab people put, put folks in a queue and you can hop on the microphone if you like everyone yeah. but deb is on yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah if you like i um i have a couple questions of my own um sure one thing right from the start, you know, you were describing in uh, really good clarity uh, the 
the nature of um, how survival instincts, when we circumvent them through various means, you know, when we're living a lifestyle where mm. you know, we don't have to think about the basic needs, basic instincts, uh, how that uh, causes us to develop this deprivation, this this state of of always needing to fill a void that can never be filled, you know, where addiction and all that comes from. And, um, I'm wondering, you know, in the in the realm of like technology, modern conveniences, obviously those kinds of things contribute a lot. How much do you advocate for like a naturalist, minimalist kind of lifestyle, kind of getting away from technology and getting closer to nature? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, in my doctorate, uh, I basically, my, my research question was, what are the conditions that would bolster and improve the mutual emergent relationship between technology and people? So in other words, in what ways can we create a win-win relationship between technology and people? Because right now we're seeing compulsivity with technology. Um, so here's, I, I'll indirectly answer your question. I don't think it actually is, um, I personally don't think we should be taking on a minimist, a minimist, uh, approach. Instead, I think we should be, um, we should learn creative living and how to harness the capacity for self-authorship in a way in which would mobilize or push the technology uh, industry or sector to begin to develop software that was in compliance with our neurobiology. Because right now what's happening is our neurobiology is being forced to comply with the way technology is built. So again, you're creating this impingement and the system's feeling starved. That makes sense? So technology is not part of our a healthy holding environment. So the system is feeling starved. Right? And then it keeps reaching for it and attempting to get what it can't get. And really, ultimately, that's because the, the, the coders, the software developers, the architects, the engineers themselves, I mean, software is just a reflection of the inner psyche of those that have developed it, mm -hmm. right? So we really do need to work with them so they can come into a state of wholeness, so they can come back into their instinctual aliveness and et cetera, et cetera, fill that void. And I think we will see a completely different technology on this planet that will support the regulation of our nervous systems. But that takes people like me and others that are kind of nerdy that want to take that on, right? Because it, it's a, yeah, it's a big challenge. But I think that's better than us just moving into a, into a minimalist because yeah, technology is here to stay. So yeah, there's no escaping it now. Yeah, I appreciate that perspective a lot. Yeah, because yeah, it's the easy answer is just, oh, you know, live more natural, live and go camping more. But yeah, it's it's just not feasible for a lot of folks, you know, especially urban living. And I mean, a lot of people, this is how we communicate now on computers. And so, um, exactly. I, yeah, it's, it's. And if you think about, so let's talk about, I love like that, what you just brought up for a question, if you think about it, like yeah. if we are to be agents where we're actually to make a change in technology, think about the the instincts that need that are thwarted that need to come to life. We have to be fighters, right? Mm -hmm. We've got to be more assertive in terms of making that demand, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So anyone who has a level of avoidance of their own fight response, their own anger, their own rage, and maybe they move into compulsive eating or compulsive sex addiction or compulsive meditation as an attempt to thwart that rage, you lose a sense of your capacity to, to be an agent in this world and make change in the world. So that's just one example of something that, that would need to come back into being, right? Mm -hmm. And then the other, the other capacity is social engagement, attachment. We need to have compassion, for others and for ourselves to actually have a sense of morality around the situation and understand the nuances and attune to how the heck would we do this? So anyways, mm -hmm. so there's a lot there just in that. Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, the elements of integration I often talk about our, our lifestyle and our relationships, our work, and you're mentioning all of those as part of how do we engage in that active aliveness, that agency, 
it's all those external aspects of our lifestyle. So yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, we had an, uh, a hand up. Yeah, Cheryl, please. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this, and, and this may not be something that you can trust, but as you're, as you're talking about these things, I just have this, this question, like as, as a, a professional who works with people, like, do people understand, um, like that these sort of modern tools and that our and that society kind of promotes this you know kind of promotes compulsion or promotes all of this i mean you're there's so much that we're working against you know working two jobs not being able to go out you know just living to survive and things like that and so you know like we we know that there are tools to help these but there's so much i just wonder if you know people are aware of that how do we change that you know yeah. Um, so again, yeah. your question is, are people aware of just how much culture influences? Yeah. Our... I mean, yeah. Like, I mean, people who like people who gamers, do they realize what's happening mm -hmm. with them? You know, do they realize that that this programming that's done is sort of designed to suck, suck you in just like it does, you know? Yeah. The algorithm. Right. It's, yeah. Almost like it's mining our soul. Right. Yeah. It's it's I mean. If I was Dr. E if I was Dr. Evil, that's what I would want to do. So it's a big, it's a big, right? I mean, yeah, have have people like like 24 hours a day engaged in what I'm creating. Oh my God. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's not I really think that's why that's not really <laughs> say again. I didn't hear that. Say again. I didn't hear what you said, Cheryl. Yeah, it's okay. I think she's just saying thanks. Uh, we got another hand up though, Carol. You want to hop on the mic, Carol? Oh yeah, sorry, I was starting my video. Yeah, yeah. Really good. it's so interesting. Um, this information is really, really good. Um, I had to look a few things up while you were talking just to make sure I was tracking with you. But so, what's the process you go through to? if you realize you have a compulsive behavior around food or whatever to getting to what's uh, what's the, what you're trying, what's missing, what, where you're feeling like you don't have agency in your life, like which part, whether it's the attachment part or the, you know, not, ex how, how do you kind of discern that? I imagine that's a long process. And it's a long process. Um, I've got a couple of slides that I'll show. So it is a good question. And I, I, I did a talk with Christopher like two months ago, and we really went into a lot of detail around kind of how to, how to diagnose and assess. So that might be something of interest to you. Um, and I, I, Chris maybe can post it or I'll post it so you can have access to it. It's on my YouTube channel. Oh, um, okay. But how about, so that's, it's actually, one of the pieces in my slides. So maybe I'll talk a little bit here and then maybe we'll just go back to the slides for it because that is the ultimate question. Um, and really, so each author has their own approach to how you would address that. But again, I, I went back to Donald Winnikoff because he was really a, very much a pioneer in, I loved the way he approached it, just the sense of deprivation and we're being deprived of a living experience, a human experience. Um, and what he suggests is that children who overcome compulsive behavior, it's with two conditions, play, they're allowed to play, and it's like a, a certain type of play, it has to have, it has to embody certain principles and concepts, and they have a healthy holding environment, right, there's enough safety in the environment for them to then play, okay, so let's, let's kind of go into this a little bit more. Um, hmm, how should I put this in a way that's I'm trying to think of which one to go into first? You know what? We'll just put up, bring up the slides. So that'll be the easiest. All right. Okay, here we go. So Donald Winnikoff and Stephen Porget, their suggestion for restoring order is they say play. Play has the potential to integrate many of these subsystems together at, at once. 
And it also has an opportunity to expose certain subsystems. Like through play, you can expose to see which sub, sub these subsystems need to be worked on and it helps develop them, okay? So let's go into this. So there's two different types of play, as you know. Like play as a concept may not make any sense to us as adults, especially because the instinct for play is kind of like snuffed out of us. Is That's another instinct that's sort of being diminished and hijacked. And now we play video games and that, that's not the kind of right play that I'm talking about. So there's a concept called defensive play versus healing play, okay? So gaming, um, would be an example of possible like defensive play, right? Extreme sports where you're really hurting your body, example of defensive play. So we know we have people in our lives that play in a way in which it doesn't heal them. You're not seeing any change in them. It's not transforming them. It's not helping them evolve. It really is almost like another uh, coping strategy or another compulsion that when they might be going to, to quote unquote play in an attempt to either thwart the underlying uh, sort of systems that are that are in struggle, or they're actually trying to create some sort of sense of artificial aliveness, right? So if we are, um, if our light, if our essential self, if our sense of aliveness, our sustenance is diminished, the system is going to create artificial aliveness. So how do we get artificial aliveness? We can get it through um, pornography, masturbation, uh, compulsive eating, eating lots of sexy kind of foods that stimulate us, right? Um, uh, things like that. We, we can turn into almost like being very uh, visually uh, stimulated things that just like, like really super, super loud music, um, things like that overstimulate the system in an attempt to get an artificial kind of aliveness because our system itself is so numb and thwarted. That's defensive play. That's not what I'm talking about. And I also want to suggest say that play is so important that there was um, a study done on serial killers and they wanted to know if there was a common thread among serial killers. And what they discovered was it wasn't trauma that triggered serial killing. It was a lack of play as a child. That a lack of play, so if they had, if these um, individuals had parents that, for example, were so hyper focused on the child performing and getting, you know, straight A's, being the best, and there was no room for play those individuals became obsessed with some sort of um, like fantasy killing realm, fantasy rape killing realm, right? That's the power. That's what played, like without play, our systems completely dysregulate. If I think about it, like the more and more I study play, I did it, it was a major aspect of my doctorate. And I always wondered why I was interested in play and how I got to a point where I was able to recover from some of the struggles I've had where others haven't. I think it was because as a kid, the one thing I had more than anything else was play. Like we played every day and I didn't have a good home life. There was a, like a decade of molestation. I had like really horrific, horrific trauma. But the one thing, that I had was play. And I think it, it's what saved my butt. So let's talk about this a little bit more. Okay, play. So play triggers a skill called neuroception, right? Neuroception is just a fancy word that Stephen Porgy made up. He's a neural behavioralist. And it means um, a sense of internalized safety. Neuroception is your brain's ability to pick up cues of safety in the internal or external environment. It's like having your own personal surveillance system, right? So it basically detects uh, cues of threat and cues of safety, and then tries to respond to them, right? Play is the number one process 
that builds this unconscious, deeply neurobiological skill. Right. So peekaboo, peekaboo game that is very instinctual to babies. You don't have to teach it. Is is a game that builds neuroception. It helps that infant begin to learn how to detect cues of safety from cues of threat and to be able to mobilize or fight flight and respond from them. Right? In addition, here's the thing. If neuroception, so the ability to track cues of safety and no safety and internalize that and be able to mobilize, if if you have a really good sense skill in neuroception, you're going to feel comfortable in your own skin because you, you're like, oh, I got it. Like if a threat comes, I know how to navigate it. I can detect it. So I feel comfortable in my own skin, right? Then what happens is there's less fuel going to the, the, the lower brainstem parts of your brain that are constantly in a manic state of managing your life and in hypervigilance. And there's more glucose and fuel going to the more creative centers in, in your brain. So now you have a capacity to create your life. So there's less stress and less load on your nervous system, which means more regulation, which means less starvation, less deprivation, and more sense of aliveness because the system knows that it can actually respond to threats. So this is the power of neuroception. It's like a surveillance system. Play builds like that, like no tomorrow. Okay. So if you think about something like, um, let's actually, do I have, here it is. Let's look at um, this slide. So we're back to the brainstem. So if we think about play, so the peekaboo game or cops and robbers or hide and seek, we have, there's mama, there's dad, look at that. I'm safe, I'm connected. I'm aware of my surroundings. Mom, hi dad. And then mom, dad hides there. Where'd mom go, where'd dad go? And the system mobilizes into a fight flight. So right there, the child is learning how to move into vigilance, mobilization as a response to threats. The child is also learning about reading facial cues. Facial cues, where's mom? I can't see mom, right? So the child is learning to read facial cues, attuning, detecting, attuning, detecting, attuning, detecting. That's helping the child build the skill of detection, right? Attunement. And then it's moving into a state of vigilance, mobility. And then mommy's back. And then the system calms down and moves into a state of social engagement. So think about the subsystems that could be thwarted. Social engagement, mobilization, right? Creative living are just three. So play does what? It builds the social circuits of relationship, of attachment, of attunement, right? It also builds the circuits of knowing when to fight, of when to flee, how to mobilize. And it's also building the circuits of being able to move in up and down, be able to modulate in and out of that so you don't get stuck. A lot of people get stuck up here in mobilization and can't come back down into social engagement. So play itself is just literally like that infant is learning three of those subsystem skills. Again, attachment, co-regulation, mobilization, autonomic nervous system regulation, and because play builds an internalization of safety, it then evokes the creative centers. In addition, we all know, oh, where's mommy? Mommy disappeared. The infant or the child now moves into her imagination. She's like, oh, what's going on? And then they begin to move into a more fantasy realm. And then they come back grounded into, there's right? And it's back and forth, the imaginal realm, the grounded real realm, imaginal realm, grounded real realm, that triggers much more strength in the dialectic tensions that you need when you're actually creating something new. We can imagine into the realm of technology that actually is in compliance with our neurobiology, and in the real realm, that ain't happening, 
right? So we could see that dialectic just with that. Okay. So real quick, uh, pause there. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering, actually, was there another slide with this diagram, but it was in a state of neuroception, like the freeze? Or... Mm hmm. Yeah, it, you want to see, see that. that so this is, this is a, a person who has a good um, regulated nervous system. So if I saw if I could map someone's nervous system, and I saw this, I'd be like, you probably don't have a lot of addictions or compulsions, you might have some, but they're not probably going to be some not compared to others, who might have something that looks like this. That. So let's look at something like um, compulsive eating or yo yo dieting. So let's look at binge yo-yo dieting. So you've got, I'm on a diet, but I'm in the state of like, go do force performance. So I've got my foot to the floor on the gas pedal. I'm exercising a lot. I'm dieting. I'm doing it. I'm like motivated. I'm go, go, go. So we kind of have the sympathetic charge, sympathetic charge, high energy, tense, go, go, go. Right. Now think about it. The nervous system think when you hear nervous system think mother nature mother nature is boss and mother nature doesn't like to be in vigilance all the time she's gonna find a way to try and bring some balance to that vigilance having a nervous system that's continually in vigilance is just uh, asking for disaster so she's going to attempt to bring herself down to this here well she can't because those circuits have gone dormant. So what happens is she ends up recruiting the dorsal vagal freeze response instead. How does she do that? She forces you to eat food. So compulsive eating will numb the circuits. It can produce a lot of opiates. It creates this numbing sedation sense. It can actually mimic co-regulatory social engagement features and the system is able to like almost like reset or finally just collapse right but then the system is like oh i can't stay here oh my god i need to lose weight and so then it mobilizes back into your vigilance go push do and it only can stay there so for so long and the system then moves back into a dorsal vagal collapse with the food and so now you get stuck in this like yo-yo dieting cycle. Chris, you, you're on mute if you're, if you were wanting to. Uh, I'm just talking to myself, but it's making okay. a lot of sense. Really. Yeah. 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 So um, you can have some people who are chronically overeating and they don't have any yo-yo. They're just binge eating, which was often what I was doing. Um, was they'll have a flat line like this. And what can show up, this is one of many examples is, again, the system doesn't like totally flat line. It's gonna try and actually bring some regulation. So it's gonna to wanna to bring some level of um, stimulation into the system. So one way that we might do that is raging against ourselves. So we're eating and then we're simultaneously yelling at ourselves, telling ourselves we're disgusting and fat and yelling. And it's an attempt at like, mobilization like that moving you that pig etc cetera, etc cetera. And, and there's a, an attempt at like an adrenaline push and then the system just goes back into the collapse is one example um uh, i just want to go ahead well, yeah in regards to your prior example, I've, it could also be the opposite, right? Where you're stuck in the blue, like you're kind of like numbed out and then you do something to get a charge of adrenaline or whatever. You got it. Yeah. You'll see this with, um, uh, so people who binge eat, they'll try to stimulate in some ways. So again, like raging at themselves is one example of how you might stimulate yourself out of the dorsal vagal freeze. Um, You'll see this with meth addicts. So meth and amphetamine is very, very uh, sympathetic, right? It's a sympathetic charge. And it, if they, when they try to cut out 
meth, what shows up is they go straight into the freeze response. So the freeze response is where their system is, is like, that's their frozenness. And they're trying to create an artificial charge by taking the meth, which tries to bring them down into the actual, uh, the sympathetic. So when then when they cut out meth, they're back to just dorsal vagal freeze. And they, and they're, they, they are so much in that collapse that they, they can't move, obviously, because they're going through withdrawal, but also there's a deeper sense of trauma that's keeping in that. And the only way they can function is if then they go back into taking some meth. And then that will actually like move them into that functional freeze. They can function. It's no different than someone who is a workaholic. So someone who's a workaholic and all of a sudden they're in retirement or they decided to take some time off the workaholism is, is like one foot on the gas, right? It's one foot in the sympathetic. They remove that compulsion and now they just go into a straight freeze response. Right? They're just numb, dead. And then they'll move into a panic because it's terrifying to be in that immobility state. And so they'll attempt to generate some other work like, okay, maybe I'll work over here or work over there. I'll find a part-time job or I'll go back to work. They can't actually go into retirement. Right. And the only way they can actually move into retirement is actually to work on the dorsal vagal freeze response that's in the way. Yeah. I want to mention something about, go ahead, Chris, if you have a question. Uh, yeah, I just had another question. Um, uh, if, you, if you want to touch on something first, uh, that's cool. Let me go into exercise for a second. Sure. And then we'll go back. Okay, so the fitness industry gone astray. Okay, so think about, this is just, neuroception is an instinct, right? It, our bodies are driven towards developing neuroception. If it wasn't driven towards developing neuroception, children would not need to play. Children have to play. Uh, if neuroception wasn't a big deal to mother nature, to our human organism, we wouldn't have the peekaboo game. We wouldn't have the hide and seek game. We wouldn't have the cops and robbers game, right? We wouldn't have any, wouldn't have tag or tug of war. Those games build an internalization of safety. They help the nervous system be able to navigate this world with a little bit more attunement and a little bit more responsiveness, right? In, in many ways, um, our culture, technology, the ways that we educate our children are thwarting or diminishing neuroception. Everything's diminishing neuroception, even the fitness industry. And if there's one industry that should be actually leveraging neuroception more than any other industry, it should be the fitness industry. And they're not, they're doing the opposite because exercise is a form, can be a form of play and it can be a simple way to build neuroception. But instead, we're taught to see our bodies as just this mechanical body that you get on a treadmill and run for 30 minutes and then get off like you've just taken it to the dry cleaners, right? We're not seeing it as a living organism that has a need for neuroception, the embodiment of, of safety, et cetera, et cetera. And so when we get on a treadmill and we run for 30 minutes, we're, we're in some ways negating that the living system. And we're just like, we're negating its need for, for example, neuroception, okay? We're just treating it like an object. We're treating it like a machine that's getting its exercise like a dog and off we go. Now, for some of us who have more sensitive systems than others, our neurobiology or our, our, the mother nature that is in us will not let us do that. We will start to feel like exercise is a threat. It will not look safe anymore because it is not safe. If we are forcing ourselves to get to the gym and do those like 10 miles on the treadmill where we're staring at a TV, that's not building neuroception and our neurobiology knows it. And over time, we will not be able to stick with that exercise. We'll have to basically be the brute to force ourselves into the gym to do that over and over and over again, because our bodies will fight us it's going against the grain, the against the fabric of who, of the living, of our living existence and what it wants and what it craves. It, it craves movement 
that builds the living system, that builds sustenance, that builds our neural perception, not the other way around. Okay. All right. So that was my song and dance on that. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. It really points out that you can kind of turn anything into like a numbing. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Going back to that, that drone free state. Um, I wanted to ask, so uh, you made a great point in connecting things like meditation, psychedelics, uh, you know, these kind of transcendent states of consciousness to uh, ironically uh, uh, addictive patterns and um, using it as an escape uh, and, and that being being a, a big problem in, in a lot of circles. Where I'm, I'm curious on that chart with the sympathetic, parasympathetic and the social engagement, where would where would you put those activities, uh, those kind of transcendental states? Um, that's a good question. Okay, so that's going to bring me to another slide. That's actually a really good question. Maybe that's where we'll, we'll end is uh, talking about that piece. All right. So let's look at healthy play as a portal into change, into possibility, into recovery from food addiction, sex addiction, whatever your addiction is. All right. So with play, you are balancing three, let's call them dimensions or yeah, or three aspects of self. I don't really know what to call them, but let's look at something like um, uh, hide and, the hide and seek game, for example. So we have, or any game, uh, cops and robbers, any game really would work. You've got one part of you that's, in the present moment, in the material world, you're in a state of, you're like, you're in the house, in, you know, outside playing, you're in relationship, you're in your body, you know what time it is, you know what the date is, you know what, where you are, right? You know your name, you know your friend's name, you're maybe there with your, with parents, if you're a child or with a facilitator. So there's certain amount of grounding in the material world. Then you are also not grounded in the material world you're you are in a place of the imaginal realm of possibility of pretend play of evoking these instincts right you're in a realm of metaphor of the archetypal dimensions your timelines get distorted you're sort of playing this hide and seek game right um if you're dealing with some well let me hold on off from the next part which i was going to talk about events i'll add that later because it's a little bit more sophisticated but so you can see with play you've got one foot on ground and one foot in imagination right now you have a third part of yourself which is your observer self this is your mindfulness self this is your transcendental part of yourself it comes in and it's monitoring and it's saying do i have too it's or it's too much of myself in fantasy is too much of myself in the imaginal realm Am I too much being in possibilities and daydreaming in that place where I think anything is possible and I don't have enough grounding in the real world, in my real body, in this time and space and dimension? Or is it the op opposite where I'm so grounded and rigid in the present moment, I can't even muster up you know, laughter or any imagination and I'm just stuck here, right? So you have this observer self that is continually monitoring, it's tracking where you're out of balance, where you're doing well. And, and we need this because let's say if we're in this realm of fantasy and we're playing with one of our friends and we accidentally hurt them, we're like, bang, bang, you're dead. And we really hurt them. Well, it takes us out of the realm of fantasy and play and imagination and the archetypes and the metaphors and brings us back into the real world oops, I hurt my friend. Ooh, I better apologize, right? The observer part is able to observe the where we are in our living experience. Okay. So you have one foot in that, in that place of observer or mindfulness and another foot in our experience. Okay. 
Okay, let's take a look at it from the place of psychedelics. And then we'll end here. So, oh, hang on. My, uh, I had myself plugged in, but it's not, um, my battery is dying. Not sure what's happening. I think we've still got enough time here. Okay, so let's look at the psychedelic somatic interactional model. I love this model because it depicts play, healthy play. With the help of, say, for example, ketamine, what's happening is you have one foot in present moment. I'm grounded in the material world. You know, I know what time it is, I know what my place is, I know my facilitator is here, et cetera, et cetera. Then with the help of the psychedelic, you move into imaginal realm where you're working with trauma, but you're working with it from a place of metaphor, from a place of archetypal dimensions. You're beginning to bring these archetypes forward within the relationship that you're in. The whole room and setting can be a playground to reenact the trauma in a safe way while you've got one foot on ground and one foot in this imaginal realm where the room all of a sudden becomes alive with the event memories. But you don't get sucked into the event memories and think they're real like flashbacks because you have one foot on ground and your facilitator is there to support you in doing that. What tells you you've got one foot on ground is because you've got that observer part watching. Hmm, how much of myself is on, on planet Earth? How much of myself is actually experiencing and allowing the trauma to come forward in, the, in this archetypal you know, metaphor dimension through my body, through relationships, et cetera? How, does that make sense? How does that land? Folks, chime in if they want. Uh, yeah, I think that makes sense. I think you explained it really well. So I think this is where the um, you are using the psychedelic. The psychedelic is not what is not what is making the difference. It isn't what's healing you. What's healing you is a number of things. It's one, to be able to be in that dynamic of play, one foot in the observer noticing, oh, I can now step into the imaginal realm. I can evoke these event memories, these traumatic memories. They can come to life in my experience. But I also know that I'm in, you know, 2023, I'm, I know my name, I know the time, like what time it is, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what's needed, right? It's no different than children playing. They've got one foot grounded in reality, and one foot in the imaginal realm. Right? So you've got a number of qualities or characteristics of, that, of the psychedelic somatic model that does the work. The relationship does the work. Your sense of mindfulness does the work. Your ability to pendulate does the work. The medicine is just one little piece. It just lifts a little lot, a little bit, but it's not what does the work. Yeah, this is an element of integration that I'm, I'm realizing for myself. I don't talk about enough. You know, I, I say a lot about you know you need to live a healthy life. You know, uh, improve just kind of. The, the functionality of things, but um, there could still be these you compulsive habits, this sense of like, you know, just craving something, you know, just I need some some sweets or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and this is filling a big uh, a meaningful part of, especially if psychedelics are a big part of your life, meditation, spirituality, those things I, I think very easily can leave out that um, engagement portion of it, uh, the, the grounding into some sort of uh, action. Uh, I mean, socialization, I think, is, is a wonderful thing to point out. But um, some of these uh, acts of play, though, like jujitsu that you've talked about in the past, 
um, that's why it's so tangible, you know, so it's like really you're literally getting your hands around something and, and going back and forth between that sympathetic and parasympathetic state, um, having that rhythm in general. Uh, yeah, I appreciate the clarity on that. Real good. Yeah. Um, I would, if, if you think about, if we're looking at subsystems that are compromised and the nervous system is trying to bring them, them back to life, with the the psychedelic somatic model right the one the one system that the two systems that really get nurtured is that attachment system right that's what gets the corrective because we're deeply as facilitator and as yourself you're deeply observing your own event memories your own history with this deep attunement and we're looking at at the body we're looking at how the relationships are showing up in this metaphor way in this subtle attuned but profound way and that is so corrective for the system it's getting what it didn't get back then back then many of us wanted and craved a sense of attunement someone was there with us and could help us navigate through some of that messiness so what does the nervous system do it reenacts that so it can get that corrective so i remember when i was doing sessions um, for myself and I was using, my nervous system had the whole room as its theater. So it was using pillows and I would end up falling and a pillow would collapse on my face. And so the pillow became a metaphor for hiding my face due to shame, right? Or my hair would go across my face. And that was me hiding again, shame. Or, right, You'd like the whole room becomes a theater for the reenactment. And the only way that you're able to work through that and allow for these correctives to come forward, as opposed to get sucked in and feel like they're true, is if you've got the facilitator there that's kind of supporting and attuning, and you're both grounded with one foot in reality, well, you've got one foot in that event memory evocation. And that does require a sense of mindfulness. Right. So again, just in that one example, where we are uh, um, uncompromising or bringing to life many of the dimensions that get thwarted, body, fight, flight, mobilization, attachment, um, the creative spirit, the creative play, as well as narrative and uh, memory integration. And maybe I'll say one last thing, which is... Uh, so um, you don't have to do, people are very drawn nowadays to psychedelic medicine. Um, and it, we also need to make sure that we're not getting sucked into the hype, just like, so it does become another compulsion that in many ways, the concept of play, uh, I believe needs to be embedded into our lifestyle. Everything we do, can be an embodiment of play, at least the concepts of play, right? So um, the way we make our meals and that I'm not saying you need to like put on some music and dance around your kitchen. That's what I'm not talking, that's not what I'm talking about. But when we are always have one foot in possibility for what's available to us and one foot grounded in reality, right? And we're needing to observe where are we? So for example, if I go to jujitsu, I've got one foot scanning my body and scanning the room, making sure that I'm in a good place to go and do jujitsu where I'm not gonna get hurt. That's me grounded in my body, grounded in relationship. Are the people I know gonna be there? How am I doing? And then I've got one foot grounded in possibility and fantasy. And I'm like, oh, I get to like, like kick someone's butt tonight or they're gonna kick mine, one of the two. Right? So it's opening up this whole imaginal world where so much of my fight instinct and so much of my social engagement instinct and my flea instinct was immobilized and thwarted and comp compromised. And every single day of the week, I get to go and actually actualize that and mobilize that and bring that to life. Right, And I don't have to pay anyone to do it. I just get to go and have fun and have some giggles. And, and that, that to me is therapy. So we can do that with anything. We can do that with our relationship with food, with our relationship with exercise, with our relationship with work. Everything can be a creative pursuit 
that embodies the concepts of and principles of play. It doesn't have to be silly. It doesn't have to be like, you know, what we think of as child's play. It just has to embody those elements to begin to actually evoke a new possibility around compulsions. You know, one thing comes up maybe for your next talk or, or discussion in the future is, um, you know, when we're looking at uh, psychedelic therapy treatments or other similar kinds of modalities to, um, you know, get at this uh, neuroception, um, how this act of play and uh, the actionable dynamics uh, between the fight or flight response and the like calmness how that maybe can look in like a psychedelic therapy setting. Like, can you engage with some of that in that state where you're a little bit more open, you're a little bit more flexible and, and you know, and imprintable and be able to shift your patterns? I would say 100% yes. Yeah. Um, yes. There's, uh, there is a meth, um, a tool called SSP, um, Safe and Sound Protocol that Stephen Porger puts out and um, which builds neuroception, internalization of safety. And I will do that sometimes uh, if I've taken ketamine and I notice I can go deeper with those two, with those two pieces because SSP is, is a form of play. And then if I, ketamine, because it softens the rigidity, it can just allow you to actually soften into it lets it does exactly what you're suggesting, Chris. So it lets you kind of go into that realm a little easier. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I imagine you have to be uh, cautious, you know, not to push the boundaries too much since you're in the, such a vulnerable state on psychedelics, but I can see it being extremely, mm -hmm. extremely effective for people who are so like um, stuck in that freeze state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd have to say I would not like where I, I mean, I started this journey 20 years ago, or longer than that, but if someone introduced the cons, if someone introduced to me the concepts that I'm introducing to you guys 20 years ago, I would have ran from the hills. I would not be able to have the capacity to listen to myself. Like play would have terrified me. If you think about what play is about, it's, it's about release. It's about right moving into states of unknown, of um, uncertainty, of moving past your comfort zone and bringing the state into a little bit of dysregulation because you need that you need to be on the edge of your comfort zone and moving into dysregulation in order actually to recover you've got to step outside that window of tolerance to increase your window of tolerance i had no tolerance for that at all i would have ran so it it is it takes baby steps to kind of explore this i wanted someone to just give me a quick fix tell me what I needed to do. I did not want to actually have to dive into this whole realm. It was too terrifying. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. That was, that was what I would scream out to the universe. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. And well, it, I kept getting pointed to this realm, which would terrify me. Wow. This is great. Yeah. Any last questions? I actually do, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. um, in the beginning, um, like way towards the beginning, um, you had said something about um, when our survival instincts are engaged, we feel mm -hmm. more. Was that alive? I didn't. I. I didn't quite catch. Yeah. That. Yeah, I think it was um, uh, Peter Levine's statements. Let's see if I can find it. I think it was like maybe the third or fourth. Um, oh, not that one was it? This one here. Our ancient design remains intact. Thus, our legacy is to feel really alive only when our survival instincts are fully oh. engaged. Okay, yeah. got it. Perfect. We must Thank unveil you. our instincts. Yep. So again, if you think about what our instincts are, our instinct, we've got an instinct to mobilize. We've got an instinct to engage, socially engage. We've got an instinct to create our lives. Right? Creative living is an instinct. 
instinct for neuroception. Uh, we've got the instinct to make sense of our lives through our past experiences. And we have the instinct to um, be mindful uh, because we need that mindfulness to be able to observe our experiences. We just don't want to overdevelop it. Yeah. There's, um, I want to show this slide. So Albert Einstein was suggested that he said this quote, the universe is a friendly place. And I think the reason that he thought that is because he got the concept maybe of play, that ultimately this is how we, we resolve. Like there's, a, there's aspects of this instinct of play that is so critical and under, um, I don't know, underutilized in our serious business culture that is important to our capacity to self-author and change the world, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, go for it. I, I, I just really, really, I wanted just, just to understand the, the concepts of like, how does attune, the concept of, of attunement um, relate to neuroception? Like does attunement possibly lead or help build neuroception. I just try and understand how those concepts work. Yeah. Out. Right. Okay. So let me know if I'm not answering your question correctly, but uh, how does attunement um, lead to neuroception? Okay. I'll answer it two ways. So if you've got um, a child playing peekaboo, so, and mom's smiling and the child is tracking and attuning to mom's face, that child is seeing a smile, seeing bright eyes, is hearing this voice of like sweetness, right? Hues of safety coming through the, through the voice, pitch, tone, intensity. Baby is intensely listening and absorbing that. Their attunement, um, uh, what do we call it? Circuits are just completely alive, right? And then like, so the baby's taking in mom's face and mom's safety cues in her face. And then all of a sudden that face goes away. And so then the system goes into vigilance, right? And it's like, oh, my attunement is telling me mom was there. And now my attunement is saying something's not safe, right? It's like, and so it's practicing looking at safe cues and attuning, tracking the other, and then it's practicing what it's like when it, when it can't see the cues, right? So this would be a cue of not safety to the infant. This is a cue of safety. So it's just, yeah. And so the same with something like cops and robbers or, or um, uh, what is that, tug of war, uh, hide and seek. So um, if we're playing cops and robbers and we run after our friend and we say, bang, bang, you're dead and we push them to the ground, right? The person who gets pushed to the ground is going to turn around and look and start attuning to the mm -hmm. person who pushed them. And mm -hmm. they're going to be going, did you push me because you were playing or were you serious? And that is... And so now you've got this co-regulatory process happening with the attunement. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, you were just playing. Or if the, if the child's like, oh, I'm so sorry. Then it's like, oh, you're concerned about me. So you're seeing all of that through the facial features. Mm -hmm. that's, that's basically step number one of neuroception is that detection, that attunement, that real deep tracking. And we're not getting it anymore in our society uh, due to technological formats and video games so all of that is often getting missed okay i see thank you that's helpful and i i will say stephen porgy has got a a, a talk mm -hmm. um that's about uh when the facial circuits aren't uh, stimulated enough like there's not enough attunement um co-regulatory that the body will try to actually use food in an attempt to stimulate those nerves Mm -hmm. which I find is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you.
Awesome. Yeah. One theme that I'm, I'm gleaming from this is there's a rhythm to life, you know, and, mm -hmm. and one, 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 way, one way or another, I mean, you're going to fall into a rhythm. Hopefully you fall into a rhythm that uh, is regulating your nervous system, your, your sense of um, uh, just kind of your internal senses in a way that is sustainable. You know, I, I like those charts a lot because it shows that some people regulate into freeze a little too much and, uh, and a healthy person is able to go back and forth between a sense of safety and a sense of like a little bit of uh, energy or stress, you know, so I guess that's a good example of like healthy stress versus unhealthy stress, right? Because stress mm -hmm. is not a bad thing in itself. It's just if we are chronically in it or we never are in it, we lose that rhythm. So having just amount of st enough stress to to be able to keep us healthy seems like a good idea. Yep, you got it. Yeah, we need stress. It's just a matter of how much. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a good piece to put, bring in. Oh. Very cool. Well, I'm going to post your links again for folks. Um, yeah, Majaya, Lisa has a lot of great services. Uh, maybe you want to end with just saying a little bit about what kind of stuff you offer, maybe one on one stuff or group stuff. Yeah, so um, I do one on one. Um, I do the PSI model, so the psychedelic somatic interactional model, psychotherapy model. Um, I co facilitate groups and teachings and apprenticeships. Um, classes so reach out to me and i can let you know what's available if you're interested awesome very Thank good you, everyone. Are those all, um, in person all those classes Say again the classes are those in person like the things you're talking about uh no everything's virtual oh, okay. um yeah okay there's Thanks. some stuff where we offer intensives that sort of thing where you can come face to face but most of it's virtual Okay, thank you. Awesome. Well, I'll just say uh, thank you, um, Jaya, Lisa. Um, this has been great. I, I love your perspective. Like I said, uh, you draw from a lot of different places and uh, I think you do a good job at, at synthesizing a, a holistic view of things that it's not easy to get that from a, you know, a lot of so-called experts. So um, yeah, thank you for coming. and. Um, yeah, keep in touch with with uh, Lisa or myself. Uh, um, you know, we we're kind of members of this greater psychedelic community out there. You know, folks interested in healing, personal growth. So keep in touch if you're interested in going deeper on that. Um, and we'll see you next time. Yeah, yeah. Hit up the meetup and uh, get on the mailing list. And yeah, we'll keep in touch. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Bye. This was awesome. Thanks. Have a good night. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.